All right, y'all, I'm so excited about this conversation. I get to sit down with my new friend and counselor at Daystar Counseling and author of Raising Worry-Free Girls, Sissy Goff. Sissy, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So I've got a couple of your resources here. Braver, Stronger, Smarter, which you said is a curriculum. It's a workbook for elementary age girls. Okay, elementary age girls. And then we have this book, Raising Worry-Free Girls. You have a new book that just recently came out. Tell us about that. Yes, it's for adolescents and it's called Brave. And pre-pandemic, the age group I was most concerned about were elementary age kids. The average age of onset had been eight and it was dropping to six. Wow. And now in the midst of the pandemic, I'm most concerned about adolescents, which is why the Brave book came out. Gotcha. So what's interesting is there's obviously a theme to your work. I'm like, that's (laughs) what I wanted to bring. Like, let's start here. There's a theme to your work. And you talk about raising worry-free girls. As soon as I saw this title, I mean, my daughter's one and a half. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. I need to read this. I need to know. And so I just, I want to, I want to unpack this. Let's just start with why did you want to tackle this issue and help us understand why is it an issue? How much is this an issue in our world with our kids, especially young girls, with anxiety, fear, worry, all of that? Help us understand what what we're looking with, we're looking at here. It's a huge issue, and really, before the pandemic, it was already considered a childhood epidemic in America, and we were looking at one in four kids dealing with anxiety with girls twice as likely. Wow. Now we're looking at one in three, and so it's just so prevalent among kids, and in fact. As I sit down with families in my office, I feel like if an oldest child is a girl, she's pretty much going to have some degree of anxiety today. It's just that rampant. Yeah. Okay, so I can guess some of the factors. Yes. Um, Social media comparison, the standards of, like, performance that are just higher and higher with every generation— I'm just making that up on the fly, but help me understand why is it so bad right now? You're exactly right. All of those things, technology, social media for sure for kids who are on it, and then technology in general. I mean, if you think about when we're looking at a device, our brains are being bombarded with images and they move into kind of this agitated state that mimics anxiety. And so, and their brains aren't developed, so they can't calm themselves back down yet. So that's a part of it. And then I have never... I've never had as many conversations with kids who feel as much pressure as mm-hmm. they do today. Yeah. I mean, they feel like they have to succeed academically, athletically, in every avenue of their life that even exists. And then I would say there's a parental component yeah. to it, too. Yeah. And genetically— That's what I was going to ask, that yes, pressure even, where totally, that comes from. Yes. So genetically, if you as a parent have anxiety, which, you know, today I think most grown-ups have some degree, but your kids are seven times more likely to deal with it statistically. Wow. And then I think there are even some parenting styles that contribute to it sometimes sure. without ever intending to. Sure. Okay. What, what are they? Okay, go on. Because so, so, I'm like, yes, I'm listening. <laughs> yes. So, okay. So when I wrote these books, because I was writing three on anxiety, I read 23 books on anxiety, which wow. is a whole lot of books about anything. And then obviously have been counseling almost 30 years. And so what the research says is that the two most common parenting strategies for anxiety are escape and avoidance. Mm. So a child comes into a setting that makes them afraid. And the parents, of course, as a, as a parent, you love your child. You want to rescue them. You want to pull them out. But in the books, the definition I came up with for anxiety is that anxiety is an overestimation of the problem and an underestimation of themselves. Wow. I and like And so that. if I rescue them, I'm saying, yep. That problem is so big. Exactly. It's too big. You're too small. You can't do it. Instead of giving them tools to move into it gradually right. where they feel like they're capable. Right. Okay. That's that's so interesting. So one of the things that you talk about in your book, and I, I really want to know from your expert perspective, talk to me about these terms, anxiety, worry, fear, mm-hmm. nervous. Like, help me understand, because I kind of use them interchangeably. Like, is anxiety just like a big fear? Like, help me understand from a clinical, from a from an expert perspective, a science perspective, what do these terms mean, really? That's a great question, because because we do. I think culturally now we use them sure. interchangeably. So fear is really elicited by something we're afraid of. You know, spiders or snakes or whatever, we're afraid when we're around that or we're about to be. Worry, we all worry. We have worries that come and go. And for people who are anxious, what that is, you know, we all have thousands of intrusive thoughts per day. 
So if I'm anxious, I have an intrusive thought like maybe something bad's gonna happen to my child, and then I can't get it out. It oh, gets your stuck. mind is off the rails. Exactly. I always been there. Yes. <laughs> so with kids, I'll always say it's like the one loop roller coaster at the fair. You know, it comes in and they just can't get it out and get stuck and goes around and around and around. So yeah. that would be how I would characterize anxiety specifically. Okay, so I'm curious, going back to something you said a second ago, I have two boys and a girl. Yes. My boys are older and then my daughter's my youngest. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm interested in this even from a, an adult perspective between men and women. So I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on this. I read research years ago, um, and this was, I think, in Bringing Up Boys by James mm-hmm, Dodson, like old, mm-hmm. old research. But it was talking about how um, little boys and little girls are wired differently, and little yes. um, girls tend to be more risk averse. Uh, mm-hmm. There was a, a study that showed that little girls break sooner when riding a bicycle than mm-hmm. little boys do. They tend That's to so interesting. They tend to attribute um, mistakes to themselves versus mm-hmm. outside factors. Little boys yes. are like, oh, it must have been a rock in the road. Could, yes. have, been, could yes. have been me for <laughs> sure. Um, slow, boy, little boys are slower to learn from calamities. Mm-hmm. Uh, little girls never want to make the same mistake twice. So you see some of these mm-hmm. things, and I've been using this research for years when you even forecast in the future and think of what are the implications as grown men and women yes, and how ten, uh, men can have a tendency to be overly confident when they even applying for jobs they have um, half the qualifications for where women tend to be a little bit more reserved. Yes. So so I'm curious when you when you put this lens on it of worry, mm-hmm. okay, worry, fear, cautiousness, all, all the mm-hmm. things that play into this, why, why are little girls more worried? Why are little girls more anxious? Why are your middle schoolers, why are your high schoolers experiencing this at a greater rate? Because you even say in your book, little girls uh, experience this more, but little boys are treated more. Yes. And so talk to me about the differences, even in the gender, because I think this is interesting. Well, I love what you were talking about. That's fascinating. I haven't read that, those studies, but... Yes. I mean, for girls, I think part of it is because I talk about how kids are either kind of exploders or they're imploders when they deal with anxiety. And I think boys more often explode. So we see it as anger and rage. The sure do. Yes. All those things. And so I think as a parent, you're like, something's off. We've got to go see somebody. Whereas girls so often are imploding Mm. and girls who are anxious are often perfectionistic too. And so they really kind of fly under the radar. I mean, they are at parent-teacher conferences, teachers are saying, your daughter is delightful. I wish every student was like her. Now, sometimes the rails will come off still at home because she feels safest at home. But by and large, a lot of anxiety-driven behavior makes them model kids. Yes. So we don't see and think, I need to take them in to see somebody. So I think that's a huge part of why we miss it sometimes. But I do think, I read it, article recently about how boys have have never cared less about academics and pushing themselves. Mm. It was by Leonard Sachs, who's a great psychologist, and that girls have never cared more. And that's what I'm seeing. I mean, I have to like, I have so many girls who are not okay with the hundreds. They want 104s. You know, there's just this sense of pushing themselves. But I'm going to throw out one more thing. Okay. And I, I feel like I always want to say this really graciously to anyone who's a <laughs> I'm mom. Ready, I'm ready. But... I think after all these years of counseling that every parent has one child in their family that they're the hardest on. Mm. And it's either the child who's most like you or it's your oldest child of your same gender. And so I often see moms who are harder on girls than they are on boys. And I think it's that same thing you said. We're harder on ourselves and girls feel like an extension of us. And so we push them. And so I think that's part of why girls are leading the statistics too. I'm sure it's very unintentional for any moms out there. No, that's fascinating to know because even as you were talking, my next questions that were popping in my mind, because this is so fascinating, it's kind of twofold. So maybe you could help us with this. How do we as parents identify anxiety in our kids, boys mm-hmm. or girls? What mm-hmm. are some of the warning signs there that we can go, okay, this this isn't healthy. They're getting yeah. 104s and imploding, and we, we need to know that. Yes. So what are the warning signs? Also, at the same time, and I think these are maybe connected, how can we rein in our own crazy? Like, mm-hmm. how can we not just not put pressure on our kids, but— you know, I, this is a silly example because Mary Grace is one and a half, but she right. she does what I do, right? Yes, like they model us, but they do through life. She'll, she'll come in my bathroom and she'll grab my hairbrush and go like this, like wave it on her hair because she sees that mommy brushes her hair. Yeah. So I just think of fast forwarding. If mommy is talking about how I look in a dress or, oh, this makes me look, you know, you think about what they pick up from us, mm-hmm. our own um, sense of self, our own sense of confidence, self-esteem, um, those type of things. I remember hearing um, Meg Meeker say one time, the best way to teach a daughter how to enjoy life is to let her see her mother do the mm, same. I and so then that, that message of of the example we set, which we know in our heads, mm-hmm. and we still somehow 
uh, miss how that, that effect on our kids. So our own anxiety, our own worry, how we handle situations in front of our kids who are always watching. How do we, mm-hmm. how do we identify it in them mm-hmm. and how do we rein it in ourselves mm-hmm. to not make the problem worse? Mm-hmm. Just a small question. Yeah, just, yeah exactly. <laughs> how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> so first question recognize it in them, I would watch for that exploding or imploding. Okay. And with exploding, I mean, it's it's so interesting to sit with parents of young kids because that's what they'll describe, boys and girls. Because I think, you know, they don't yet have words to say, when you change my schedule at the last moment, it makes me anxious. You know, right. they right. don't have those coping skills, the language. And so anger is always a secondary emotion. Okay. So there's something else underneath the anger. So that's where we wanna look at patterns. Is it unpredictability? Is it change at the last minute? Is it transitions? Is that when your child is exploding? Because if so, it likely is gonna be related to anxiety. So we wanna watch for that. We wanna watch for kids who are putting undue amounts of pressure on themselves. They need to study 40 minutes for a test and they're studying for three hours, you know, that kind of thing. Kids who doubt themselves a lot. Another way that I feel like I really recognize it with kids because of that one loop roller coaster at the fair is they'll ask endless questions. Mm -hmm. So the child who says, what time are you going out? When are you going to be home? Wait, who's going to be with me? Wait, when are, wh- oh, what are yeah. we doing? Or the night before when they're falling asleep, they're saying, tell me the whole schedule for tomorrow. Yeah. And then they make you go back and tell it again. Yeah. And research says we should never answer more than five questions about the same topic because mm. it's not helpful, Wow, which is interesting. So I think I will, something like that— I will like point that, that out to my children tonight. There you go. I will start tonight. <laughs> there you go. So I think we want to watch them getting fixated on something like yeah. that and asking repetitive okay. questions. And then I would say for a parent, yes, the best thing you can do for your kids is manage your own anxiety. Mm-hmm. And so if that means you need to go talk to somebody yourself, whatever you need to do, because anxious parents, even statistics say, use more um, kind of catastrophic language. Like, that's the worst thing I've ever oh, wow. heard. Yep. You know, and we don't yep. know it. Right. And so I think being aware of what gets triggered in you. That's and good. really, I mean, when I wrote those books, I think the tools that work, so the primary tools I would say that work with kids also work in grownups. So mm. doing some research and figuring out some things you can do to help your kids and for them to watch you do it yourself is so yeah. important. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I want to get into what some of those things are because I know um, I'm curious, and I'm sure everybody watching and listening is curious too. Like, what are some we've identified it? What are some things we could do? But before we do, I had another question I was thinking of as you were talking, and this may be just transparently my season of life because I've got little kids. Yes, I feel like in my season with little kids, mm-hmm. though I can I can forecast in the future and imagine it's just the exact same. You know, when they're teenagers, just a different way. Right it feels like there's a lot of chaos. Mm. Now, we have dinner around the dinner table. We have both parents in the home. We have schedule and structure to our lives. Mm -hmm. But because we have three kids, age six and under, it's just a lot of— it's a mm-hmm. lot of loud. It's mm-hmm. a lot of chaos. It feels like they are all jockeying for position. They're all trying to, Mom, pay attention to me. They're always kind of competing. And and we give them a lot of individual attention. We, I mean, we, I feel like we do a lot of things right— what I imagine is that chaos would contribute to anxiety. Yes. Chaos would contribute to it. Sure yes. does for me. Yes, absolutely. So, so when you when you're in a situation for anyone watching and listening that has larger families, mm-hmm. kids close together, mm-hmm. um, busy schedules, mm-hmm. they may be a loving, safe home, mm-hmm. but the nature of the it's time to get out the door. We got oh, basketball. We got this. Life. Yeah. How would you help someone? that is in a situation where it feels like, because I'm one of these people, where it feels like the chaos mm-hmm. contributes to the stress and anxiety for every member of the family, and you're not sure how to stop the chaos. Mm-hmm. Just another small question. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I got some big ones today. Yes. Well, <laughs> you I can mean, tell I'm living this out. Because right. I, I see how that affects them. I see they get anxious mm-hmm. with all the yelling and fighting and stuff. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, we'll separate them. We've got some strategies, but our lives in this season of life just feels very loud. Yeah. And, and I want want to help them not feel like they have to compete for, for position, not feel like they have to um, fight and scrap. And so I just, I'm curious how that, if, if you see chaotic schedules or lives or seasons and how that affects anxiety for everybody. I would say we need to slow it down. Yeah. I mean, I, I think kids are doing way too much anymore. Yeah. I mean, the three practices and getting, I mean, I have so many kids who say, I can't even get to my homework till 9 p.m. Yeah. And that's too much. It's crazy. And yeah, it really is. And so I would say, think about what you can kind of pull back and slow down from. But there is another psychologist named Dan Siegel who has something called a healthy mind platter that I love that talks about how every child needs downtime every day. And so, I mean, and he talks about all these things that kind of contribute to cognitive health. Yeah. And so I think we 
need to figure out how to have pockets of time, at least where we're slowing down, where they have kind of a quiet time every day, right. that they go in their rooms and they play quietly. We need to make sure we're aware of bedtime and that they're getting adequate rest. And, and I think one of the other pieces of that that's really important is paying attention to what each kid needs mm-hmm. because it may be that you're really extroverted and you have one child in a big family that's introverted and that child's gonna need more time in their room, more time with you individually. And 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 I have parents who say, my child kind of tanks if they're not in enough activities and other families who will say, my child is just in too much and it's making them more anxious. And so it really is about kind of reading and studying and being curious about your child yeah. and following what you can tell. And I would say for moms who are listening, for you, I yeah. mean, your gut is the greatest gift you'll ever have in your parenting. Yeah. And so really paying attention to and trusting that God is leading you there yeah. into what they each need. Yeah, that's really good. You know what I was thinking about even as you were talking, you know, last year when quarantine happened and everybody went home and calendars were cleared, we all felt this uh, gift of just a free schedule. We're like, oh my yes. gosh, walks around the neighborhood. We don't yes. have to rush out the door at this time or that time. And and at first it was awesome. And it was like, this is really beautiful. This is teaching me about what I want my schedule to look like. Mm-hmm. When life gets back to normal, I'm not going to feel it so full. Right. We had all this perspective. I did. I know I talked to a yes. lot of moms that did. But I think that the pandemic, the quarantine, and its effects on our schedule Mm -hmm. lasted so much longer than we expected or would ever wanted Mm -hmm. that now I would say what I'm sensing and even feeling in my life, the pendulum is swinging back Mm -hmm. to fill it all in. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm just, I just want to go to a concert. I just get my kid. Oh my gosh, they're having summer camp. Yes, sign them up for all the camps because oh my gosh, get them out. And it's almost like it's sending us back into that busyness before the pandemic, before we had that insight, before we had that perspective of, oh, I'm going to remember how Mm -hmm. good it feels to come home and not rush to activities. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious to see how this affects our schedules, our routines, and our rhythms. You know what I mean? Because we've been so hungry for social interaction for so long. Are you seeing, and I know we talked about social media, but especially in relation to the last year, how is that affecting anxiety in kids and and in families? Exactly what you said. I think in the beginning, I mean, it was so cool to be on Zoom with little girls in the beginning because they they were the ones I'd been most worried about that had been so anxious in my office. And then we went to stay at home and those same little girls were hopping on my computer screen on Zoom and they'd have a stuffed animal under one arm and, you know, they'd be showing me their bedroom through their iPad. And those kids were so much less anxious because I think the pressure lifted and this chaos lifted and the schedule lifted and they felt so filled up yeah. from time with, parents. Yeah. And I would say it's coming back. Yeah. Because of exactly what you said. And so I think even as a family, that is such a beautiful conversation to have right now. Let's go back to last year at this time. What were some things you learned about yourself? What were some things you learned about our family? What are things you want to hold on to and carry over into now? Because I did have so many kids talk about how much better that was. I remember one teenage girl who said, I I didn't realize I was doing too much and I'm only going to do one activity per season. And another who said, I never knew I liked to be alone. Wow. You know, I mean, the discoveries like that that we had to go back to, I think, are really important. That's such a a good insight, too, because um, in a weird way, I experienced something similar um, about a month ago. My husband actually got COVID, and so we quarantined from him. So I had all three kids by myself for— 10 days. Um, that's right, 10. Wow. Um, just want to go on record. Yes. Um, and, and as difficult as that was for, for those days, there was something beautiful in it that when I would get the kids down, I was alone. Mm-hmm. And I realized that, um, you know, I, as an extrovert myself and being social and I love friends and I love time with people, I get my energy from people, I'd forgotten how much that I actually need that. And mm-hmm. so I talked to my husband even afterwards. I was like, this is a weird thing. Don't feel like I didn't love, I didn't <laughs> miss you because I did. But I was like, I realized how I enjoyed an evening to watch a total girl movie that you would never want to watch totally. and eat girl food that has no yes. meat in it or whatever, yes. you know, or just something so cliche. Um, but these insights that if we never have it, we forget we need it. Mm. And and just like, you know, in your example of this girl, I didn't realize I needed alone mm. time or I didn't realize I only wanted to do one activity. One of the things that I think, you know, the quarantine kind of gave us perspective is I, I felt, um, because I like to go, 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 mm-hmm. um, a lot of times with my kids to do something with them is to take them somewhere and do an activity. We're going to go to the zoo. We're going to go to the science center. We're gonna, And just to realize that, like, you could do a scavenger hunt in your backyard and not go anywhere. You yes. know, that you can yes. get creative. You don't it's have financially to— financially so much easier. Totally. Yes. You don't have to load up and go all the right. time. 
for for someone listening and watching right now, and they are um, they're going, yeah, I see that in my kids. I see that in myself. Mm-hmm. What are some things they can do? What are some things they can do to help their kids with stress, with worry, with anxiety, in addition to getting healthy themselves and mm-hmm. identifying those things in themselves for a child? And maybe mm-hmm. even give me some examples at different ages, because I know mm-hmm. four year olds super different than a fourteen year old. Right. But what do they do? You know, what are some of the things that you lay out in your book? So I'll tell you my first three things. Okay. So it's kind of like counseling, a month of counseling. Let's have it. Three Let's minutes. Have it. But and I wrote these in this book because the the primary therapy technique or model we use for for anxiety is cognitive behavioral therapy. And the reality is I wrote those kind of to work people like me out of a job. Like you can do these things at home. You don't need somebody like me. If they don't work, then go see somebody like me. But I'll tell you my first three things. So the first is, here's a little science explanation. So for any of us, when we're feeling calm, you know, we have blood flowing all throughout our brain. When we get anxious, our blood vessels in our brain constrict and it shifts the blood away from the prefrontal cortex that helps us think rationally and manage our emotions. And it goes to the amygdala. Okay. That's the fight or flight region of our brain. So when I sit with parents in counseling who are like, my daughter is a crazy person when she gets to this place. Yes, because the part of her brain that can reason— She literally is. Yes, yeah. it's not even getting blood. And That's so fascinating. until we can calm our bodies back down, kids and grown-ups, until we can calm our bodies back down, we can't get back to a place where we can work ourselves out of it. So I have kids do deep breathing is the first thing I always do. With girls, I'll call it square breathing. With boys, we call it combat breathing because it sounds cooler. Okay. <laughs> and so I'll teach you how to do it. You okay. do it with me. Okay, so what you do is you put your hand on your leg. Okay. Ready. And you're going to draw a square on your leg. Okay. And with each line of the square, you breathe a different way, and you pause in the corner for three seconds. So, like, pause for three seconds. Pause for three seconds. Pause for three seconds. Don't you feel better I already? Do. Like, it calms do. me this down. so great. I'm 20 so <laughs> seconds of deep breathing resets the amygdala. That's okay. all it takes okay. is 20 seconds. Okay. And so we start there, and then the kids have calmed down, but they're still stuck in this loop. Or we're, we're still stuck in this loop. Oh, my goodness, what's happening to my child right now? Oh, no, something's wrong, something's wrong. So we calm our bodies down, and then we do what are called grounding techniques. So if you have anxiety, you're not even in the present moment. You're either in the past or in the future. And so grounding kind of pulls you back to the ground. So... Anything sensory related is grounding, which is why I like the drawing the square on the leg because you're the tactileness of that. I don't know if tactileness is a word, but we'll say this. So five, four, three, two, one is my favorite. So if you're in the car driving your child to a birthday party and they've got some social anxiety and they're getting really worked up, then in that moment you would say, tell me five things right now that you see. The trees outside, you know, whatever, five things. Tell me four things you hear. Tell me three things you feel. Tell me two things you smell and tell me one thing you taste. And that loop that they're caught in, it requires enough focus that it pulls them out. Wow, that is a cool mind trick. I know, it's a cool mind trick. With the older kids, I'll have them do math. So count backwards from 100 by sevens, which, you know, Just the focus pulls you out of the the crazy thinking loop. Exactly, exactly. And then the third thing I do with kids that's probably, I mean, really, from a mindset standpoint, it's the most important. I have them name their worries because, you know, we all have a voice in our head Mm -hmm. telling us, critical things about ourselves, telling us you can't do it. And so when they can give that worry a name, it reduces its power. Yes. so that's true for us too, right? Like that's so good. Totally, totally. So in the little girl's book, I call it the worry monster. And then I have them draw a picture of it. And then I have them, so they come up with their own name. Like I had one girl who named hers Bob. No idea (laughs) why she named her worry monster Bob, but she did. And with the older girls, I named it um, just the worry whisper, because okay. that's what it feels like. It's whispering these things in the back of our head. And so then what happens is when they can talk back to it, worry monster, I'm not listening to you. You yep. have no power over me. I'm stronger than you anyway. That helps so much. And because what happens is we can see it track over development and it shifts. Anxiety is like whack-a-mole. And so it often starts off developmentally with something bad's going to happen to someone I love. And then it shifts to... I'm going to throw up, you know, and then they get stomach upset, and then they really do think they're going to throw up. Sometimes they do. Then it shifts to performance in school. And so when she has or he has shifted to the next thing, and they come back to you as a parent and say, well, Mom, now I'm worried about this, then you can say, you know what? Sounds like Bob's back to me. Yep. Because the same tools that work, however worry manifests, work throughout. And so you can say, tell me what worked last time. And then they can use those same tools. Wow, that's so helpful. It's so practical. And it's also something that I think for for parents is so empowering because you don't have to feel like this is something out of your hands. That when you're in the car, on the way to school, before bed, you can talk through these things. You can do the breathing. You can do the five, four, three, two, one. I love that. 
Sissy, I, you can tell, could talk to you all day about this. Well, this me is too. so, so helpful. It's it's so helpful for everyone listening, not just for the moms or dads that are listening that have kids of any age, but also just for ourselves. I mean, these are things that I know we all struggle with as well. And I know people want to know where they can get this book, Raising Worry-Free Girls, but also your new book. Um, so tell them where they can get that and connect with you. So really wherever books are sold. And where our website is raisingboysandgirls.com. Okay. And then we also have, I have an Instagram account that I try to put out a lot about anxiety on, okay. Sissy Goff. And then I'm also under Raising Boys and Girls. So Perfect. any of those spots. This is so great. Thank you Thank for your you. wisdom. It's so fun to be this with is, you. This has been a huge help, and I know so many people are going to benefit from it. Thanks for being here. Yeah.